Good morning. It is Sunday, the 6th of December, 2020. We welcome those from Carryduff, Killyleigh, and any other visitors who have joined us for this internet service. Could I remind members of Carryduff of the following announcements? The Zoom service will be held this evening at 6.30 p.m. On Tuesday morning at 8.30 a.m., the early morning Zoom prayer meeting will take place. And on Wednesday night at 7.15 p.m., the Zoom midweek prayer meeting will be held. Next Lord's Day, God willing, Sunday the 13th of December, our physical service will start again at 11.30 a.m. in the church building and church hall. So that being the case, there will also be Sunday school next Sunday at 10.30 a.m. and Children's Church will also be back in action. In Killyleigh, the physical church service will start again also next Sunday at 11 a.m. in Catherine Street Meeting House. Over recent times, our clerk of session, Mr. Ian Montgomery, has been under considerable strain because of the busyness of Kirk Session matters. So Ian is trying to get some respite from session business be between now and the next session meeting. So if there are matters that you would normally discuss with him uh, or matters that you would send to Ian, please get in touch with me instead in order to give him a breathing space. And I would ask you please to remember in prayer all the members of our Kirk Session, Congregational Committee, our office bearers, leaders in our congregation, and indeed the work of our congregation generally during these days. So now let us worship God. The prophet Isaiah, anticipating the coming of the Lord, says this in Isaiah 11 and verse 1. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. So let us praise God. Again, you're at home today. You can stand. You don't need to wear a mask. And you can sing at the top of your voice. Sarah will lead us now, therefore, in our opening praise, O come, O come, Emmanuel. Come, thou Lord of might, who 
So let us now bow together in prayer. <clears throat> let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, once again we wait upon you with reverent and submissive hearts. You, Lord, have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Lord God, we thank you that even in their disobedience, you gave to Adam and Eve the promise of a savior. We thank you for your patience also with the people of Israel, even at times in their foolishness and stubbornness. And we thank you for the fulfillment of the promise that there would come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse and a branch would grow out of his roots. Almighty God, we therefore praise your name for the plan of salvation conceived in eternity and revealed in time. We bless you that in the fullness of the time, at just the right time, Christ came forth, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those that were under the law. We thank you that he did not come to judge the world. He did not come to blame. He did not only come to seek it was to save he came. And when we call him Savior, then we call him by his name. So, Lord, we rejoice that he came. And grant, O Lord, that we may recognize our need of him. And just as those came to see him at his first advent, may we too come to him. May we repent and receive him as our Savior. May we find in him pardon for guilt, cleansing from our sin, newness of life, and the first installment of that life which is everlasting. So we pray that you would be with us as we share together in this service today. Bless us, Lord, as we sing your praises, as we seek your face in prayer, as we hear your voice speaking to us from the pages of Scripture and in the preaching of your word, and grant, Lord God, that we may rightly receive the word of life and that we may be doers of it and not hearers only, for Jesus' sake. Amen. So I want to have a word now with um, uh, any boys and girls who may be um, joining us and uh, listening and looking at the service today. It was lovely to see quite a few of you boys and girls yesterday when I called at your home with a special visitor. And during this coronavirus pandemic, many of us have been spending a lot more time in our homes. For example, some mums and dads um, have not been able to go into their offices or maybe into their usual places of work and have had to work from home. And earlier in the year, lots of you uh, boys and girls weren't able to go to your normal schools and so you had to do your schoolwork from home. And of course, here in Carrie Duff Presbyterian Church, like all the other churches, there were many weeks, there were many Sundays when we weren't actually able to come um, to our normal place of worship. Just like today, we're not able to come to our normal place of worship. And so lots of us had to worship God at home, listening to internet services or participating in Zoom services. So over these past weeks, Lots of us have had to be at home a lot more. And at Christmas time, lots of people want to be at home. Folk who live elsewhere in the United Kingdom or even elsewhere in the world, they want to come home for Christmas. But the interesting thing is this. When the first Christmas took place, 
when the first Christmas took place, lots of people actually had to leave their homes. The Lord Jesus had to leave his home in heaven and come down to earth to save us. Mary and Joseph had to leave their home. They had to leave Nazareth and go to Bethlehem to register, and there Jesus was born. The shepherds, they had to leave their familiar place. They had to leave their fields and go down to the little town of Bethlehem to meet and to see the Lord Jesus. And the wise men, they had to leave home. They had to leave their homes in the east, probably Persia, uh, modern-day Iran. They had to leave their home and make a huge, long-distance trek all the way to Bethlehem to see Jesus. So, lots of people, at that first Christmas, lots of people put themselves out. They had to leave their homes in order that you and I actually might be brought in, that you and I might be brought in to God's family, and that finally, you and I might be brought into God's home, that we might be brought into heaven. So, I want to say to you boys and girls today, and to mums and dads and everyone else, I want to say um, we should be thankful. We should be thankful for all those people who left their homes in order to make the first Christmas happen. Those who left their homes, that you and I might be brought into God's family, that you and I might be brought into God's heaven. So, boys and girls, make sure that you are actually now in God's family. And the other thing I would just say is this. If you are in God's family, then there's a sense in which you and I should also be willing to be put out. We should put ourselves out, as it were, to tell others about Jesus. Or we should put ourselves out. We should go out of our way to help other people. So I hope that you are thankful for those who left home to enable you and I to come into God's family and to come into God's home forever and ever. And we're now going to look at a little video which, in a sense, reinforces all of this for us. So watch this little short video together. Joseph weren't at home for the first Christmas. They were in Bethlehem, far away from their home in Nazareth. But while they were in Bethlehem, they had a baby. The Bible tells us, so Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. So although Mary and Joseph were a long way from home, they were still a very important part of God's amazing plan. So we're going to now sing our children's hymn. It reminds us that the Lord left his home and came down amongst us. Love came down at Christmas, love all lovely, love divine.
It is with regret that we intimate the death of Mr. Stanley McBride of Balna Hinch Road, Carryduff, who passed away on Monday and whose funeral took place on Thursday. He had no immediate family circle, but we express our sincere sympathy to those who knew him and who helped him along life's way and who now mourn his passing. So let us bow together now in our prayers of intercession. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you are the God of all comfort. And so we pray that you would draw near to all who knew Stanley McBride, especially to those who were of help to him. And we pray, O oh God, that you would enable all of them to turn to you, to trust in you, and to find not only comfort, but everlasting life in the Lord Jesus. Lord God, we pray for others who have also recently been bereaved. The Houston family in the death of Eileen, the Fleming family in the death of Olive, and for all others bereaved over these past weeks and months. Lord, we know that members attending funerals, numbers attending funerals have had to be curtailed and singing praise and shaking hands and hugging, all of that has not been possible. And all of that has therefore added to the pain of loss. So, Father God, we pray that all concerned would look to Christ and find in him all that they need. As we pray for those bereaved, so likewise, Lord, we pray for those who are ill. We pray that your hand of healing would rest upon them. We pray today for Mrs. Bennett as she recovers from surgery. And we pray, Lord, for Mrs. Moss as she awaits her surgery. May both of these ladies and anyone else in a similar situation, look to Christ and find in him that peace which passes all understanding. Lord God, we pray for ourselves that you would fill our hearts with compassion for all in need. Prompt us by your spirit to do what we can, whether that be sending sympathy cards or writing a letter making a phone call, sending a text, or having a socially distanced conversation with folks on their doorstep. Lord, keep us mindful of that scripture verse which says, Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these my brothers, you have done it unto me. Heavenly Father, we also pray today for the various kinds of outreach planned for, for the coming weeks. Lord, use the scripture verses being beamed at night from our church vestibule window, the words on the wayside pulpit, the tracts that were distributed yesterday, the Christian booklets which will be given out over the coming weeks, the Christmas cards going into nursing and residential homes in the carried off area. Lord, use all of these and use also our own personal witness 
and the preaching and teaching of your word in our services, in Sunday school, and in children's church. Use all of these means, O Lord, to strengthen the faith of believers and to awaken saving faith in the hearts of others. We ask all of these things, along with the pardon of all our sins, in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. You will find our scripture reading today in the uh, book of Luke, Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, reading verses 26 to 38. Luke, chapter 1, reading verses 26 to 38. Let us hear the word of God. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she, who was said to be unable to conceive, is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. This is... The word of the Lord, inspired by God's Holy Spirit, may he bless it to all our hearts, for Jesus' sake, amen. Over recent days, many people have been saying that Christmas 2020 will not be normal. Almost everyone agrees with that. Office parties will not take place. Crash children's church and Sunday school parties will not take place. In our own congregation, there will be no carols by lamplight service, though there will be a carols by morning light service at 11.30 a.m. There will be no physical Christmas Day service, but there will be a pre-recorded Christmas Day service. And of course, people will not be able to get together in the usual ways because we are supposed to confine ourselves to a bubble of three families. So Christmas 2020 will not be normal. But then, of course, the first Christmas was far from normal, wasn't it? Let me remind you of how the first Christmas was far from normal. First of all, a virgin conceived. A virgin conceived. That was not normal. It was God's way of bypassing the normal means of human reproduction to bring his sinless son into the world. The angel Gabriel said to Mary, 
the virgin, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and you will give him the name Jesus. And astonished at this, Mary asked the angel, how will this be, since I am a virgin? Gabriel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. I believe in the virgin birth because I believe in a God who specializes in the impossible. Gabriel said to Mary, nothing is impossible with God. I believe in the virgin birth because I believe in a God who can work outside of the physical laws he created. You see, this virgin birth was indicative of the fact that God would take the initiative. God always takes the initiative. It was God who brought the first creation into existence. In the beginning, God created and here again, God breaks in and births, as it were, the new creation. God would cause Mary to conceive and bring forth his only begotten son because salvation is of the Lord. It is God's doing, not ours. And in fact, that's also true of each one of us when we come to personal faith, it is God who takes the initiative. It is God who awakens faith within our hearts by his Holy Spirit. So, a virgin conceived, and that was not normal. Secondly, Jesus was born in a stable and laid in a manger, and that was not normal. Luke says, Mary laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. That was God's way of making sure that his son would experience the depths of humiliation. The smells and sounds of a barnyard were our Savior's first human experience. Like other babies, he may even have cried at the sounds of the animals and the strangers parading round his temporary crib. And if he did shed tears, they would have been the first of many tears. Jesus would come to know human loss and sorrow, the doubts his brothers and family had about him, the loss of his friend Lazarus, and the pain his mother experienced as she saw him tortured and killed. All these hardships and so much more awaited the baby trying to sleep that first night. Though he was God, he knew what it was to be human. This would continue, of course, for over 30 years ending at his death on the cross, his burial in the tomb, and remaining under the power of death for three days. Because of his love for you and me, Jesus became fully human. And being fully human allows him to identify with us completely. Never again can we say that God is just watching from a distance. Never again can we say that no one understands us because, in fact, the one who understands us best of all is Jesus. Though now ascended up on high, he bends on earth a brother's eye. Partaker of the human name, he knows the frailty of our frame. Our fellow sufferer yet retains a fellow feeling of our pains and still remembers in the skies his tears, his agonies, and cries. So Jesus was born in a stable, 
and laid in a manger. God in a feeding trough. That was not normal. Thirdly, angels appeared to shepherds. And that was not normal. It was God's way of saying that this message, this message of the arrival of his only begotten son, this message was for the outcasts as well as the in crowd. An angel of the Lord appeared unto them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were terrified. Who is it that normally hears about world-changing events first? Presidents, prime ministers, world leaders, governments, but surely not shepherds. God didn't announce the arrival of his son behind closed doors to the important people. God didn't announce the arrival of his son to a media scrum. Rather, he told ordinary nobodies, in a sense. The shepherds were out in the fields, away from everyone else, and probably smelling of sheep. Because of the nature of their work, they could rarely attend the temple or the synagogue services. So why did God tell them first Answer, because he wants everyone to be able to join his family. This family isn't just for those who feel good or important. It's for those who feel left out, lonely, marginalized, forsaken. This family is, in fact, for the whosoever believeth. Angels appeared to shepherds. That was not normal. And then fourthly, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. That surely was not normal. He came into the world he had created, but found it was a hostile place. He came as king of the Jews, but found that most of them had no time for him. He came to bring rebel sinners back to God, but found that most of them weren't interested in being reconciled to God or brought into his family. Yes, as John tells us in his gospel, John Chapter 1 and verse 11, he came on to his own, but his own did not receive him. Two women dressed in their finest were having lunch together in an exclusive restaurant one day. A friend saw them and came over to their table to greet them. What's the special occasion, she asked. One of the women replied, we're having a birthday party for the baby in our family. He's two years old today. But where is the baby? The friend asked. The child's mum answered, oh, I dropped him off at my mother's house. She's taking care of him until the party's over. It wouldn't have been much fun with him around. How daft, how ridiculous. A birthday celebration for a child who wasn't welcome at his own party. Yet when you stop to think about it, that's no more foolish than going through the Christmas season with all its festivities without remembering the one whose birthday we are supposed to be honoring. And yet... That's the way many people normally celebrate Christmas. In all the busyness, 
the party going, card sending, gift shopping, family gathering. The one whose birthday they are commemorating is often completely forgotten. He came on to his own, and his own did not receive him. They organized a birthday bash, but couldn't be bothered with the birthday boy. I say to you, that is not normal. I hope all of you have as normal a Christmas as is possible for you to have. Maybe you'll receive some gifts. Most of us, one way or another, do at Christmas time. When those gifts are offered to you, what do you normally do? I suspect you normally reach out, you receive them, you say thank you to the giver, and you go on, in most cases, to use them. If it's a book, you read it. If it's a CD, you listen to it. If it's a jumper, you wear it. So you reach out, you receive it, you say thank you, and you use it. Well, in closing, I ask you, what have you done with the greatest gift of all? What Paul describes as the unspeakable, indescribable gift. It's a gift so wonderful that we can't adequately describe it. We can't really put it into words. Unspeakable, indescribable, the gift of Christ. Well, what have you done with the offer of that gift? To all who received him to those who believe in his name. There's the rub, there's the clue. Have you received him into your heart and life? Do you not just know about him, but actually believe, trust in him? Yes, to all who received him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children of God born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. I hope you'll receive that greatest of all gifts. If you've received that gift previously, rejoice, rejoice that Christ came and died for you and that he came into your life. And if you've never received him, then receive the greatest gift of all, this Advent, this Christmas season. Amen. May God bless to all our hearts the preaching of his precious word. Our concluding praise today is cradled in a manger meanly. Sleeping
Spirit, rest upon us and abide with us this Advent season and be our portion forevermore. Amen. <laughs> 